actually you're going to say manse, okay? So group one. Manse. So let's let's say manse. Manse. All right, cool. Are you ready? Two, three, and four. Carmen, you got this. Manse. But Carmen, that's this group four feels supportive. Yes, we are, and that's going to be our Arab, Middle Eastern, and Muslim American theater artists developing a Bill of Rights. Can we get Malika Mike? that uh, the mainstream community is engaged with. 
So one of, uh, just to give you a taste for where the, the, the Bill of Rights, uh, I have a right to tell my stories in my own words without bearing the burden of representing an entire community's experiences. I should not be expected to explain the complete history of my people or justify or apologize for their actions. So uh, it's a framework that we're working on together. Uh, it's developed by Jamil Korea Supervising and Toronto Gizziarian of Golden Thread Productions. Um, and uh, when it's prepared and ready, we'll give it to TCG for distribution. Next up is going to be uh, Beyond Orientalism Standing Together. I see Nelson and Nina standing together. We are going to be, woo! Yes! Um, we are going to be reading from a manifesto for visibility. We ask our theater community to see our talent, even if it comes in a package you didn't expect, recognize our potential, and take greater artistic risks. Hear us, hear us and ask questions if you don't know the answer. Provide the space for us to arrive at the answers together. Make us a vital part of the fabric of your world. Believe that we are an integral part of your American story. Stop casting our African-American -Ameri African and Latino brethren in Asian roles, causing them to misappropriate our culture and pitting us against each other. Educate your audiences, but don't underestimate them either. Recognize that the playing field is not equal. Privileges, is, privileges are bestowed to some and not to others. Question histories that contain an ethnocentric worldview. Allow for multiple points of views to coexist. Acknowledge that universality and relatability have nothing to do with race. Don't ignore other people's pain in your rush to defend your position. If you have hurt them, even if you didn't intend to, make it a priority to understand why. Seek to destroy institutional biases where they exist. Apply more rigor and creativity to your dramaturgy, programming, hiring, and outreach practices. Work to create inclusion everywhere you see it. Show us through your actions not your words. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is um, our Black Theater Commons Affinity Group, Dayfrina. self-identify as members of the Black, African-American, Global, African Diaspora. BTC is a network of national and international leaders advocating, activating our collective resources to enrich, nurture, and support Black theater. We do, through, we do so through advocacy, convening, and knowledge sharing. We gathered and we talked about a lot of strategies for helping the Black Theater Commons to become stronger and our just Black Theater community to be stronger. We talked about defining and demanding our own work. We talked about mentoring and small theater companies finding larger theater companies to be mentored by. We talked about building a community of Black Theater critics, writers, scholars, um, our, our own um, people to tell us uh, what, what in our community is of worth and what is great. We have those people and we want to lift them up. Um, we also talked about creating a fund for black theater um, and uh, co-facilitators with the Equity Diversity Institute, including Carmen, shared about a national effort to create a fund for an equitable theater ecology where predominantly white institutions would perhaps take a surcharge of their ticket sales and redistribute that for a more uh, equitable theater ecology. So we shared that. We also talked about um, how we should be elevating our, our own uh, playwrights in our communities. So elevate our, and choose our next August Wilson, and then how can we have them perhaps even tour through black theaters throughout the United States. And we talked about having a future convenient perhaps just for arts administrators, because that is so key. We also talked about, um, oh, great. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, I'm looking at this list, we've already talked about that. Um, uh, we also discussed um, 
uh, talking to educators to make sure that um, African American plays are being taught um, in the schools. And if you are a teacher, do it now. Get it in your curriculum. Last thing we're having a social gathering this evening and another planning meeting tomorrow. So, we see you. Done. Hey! Yeah. Yeah. Action. Uh, that was beautiful. Up next is Culture Change, creating an inclusive production department. production departments in predominantly white institutions to a more anti-racist um, uh, way of working and being inclusive. And so specifically around that, we talked about one of the main barriers. One of the main barriers that we see is uh, if you were in Cleveland, you know this famous line, the keys are in the living room. Yeah. 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 You want to find your keys, go to the living room. This year, we talked about how to keep those keys. Because the biggest problem that most organizations will have in a diverse hiring is that is inclusion. As I always say, diversity is a tool. Inclusion is the goal. Okay? Because if, if we're not approaching it that way, we're going to hiring, we're going to be in a constant cycle of hiring because no one's going to stay. Um, so that's kind of where we, we went with the entire conversation. Yeah, and the one last thing I'll say is, is one of the key things we talked about as a challenge is the microaggressions that happen every day, um, all the time, in each of our shops, and how to start breaking that down and creating trainings and, and dialogues to help um, help those institutions start to shift. Thank you, thank you. Up next is Instead of Red Face. Um, so thank you for that, and you 
you guys, we need you. You know, I'm not gonna cry. Last year I cried and cried. I'm not gonna do that this year. Because this year has been awesome. In a year since Cleveland, I can't, the list of stuff that's going on in the American theater involving indigenous artists and indigenous stories is crazy huge. It's gotten, it's like triple since Cleveland. So congratulations. Keep up the good work, you guys. Started by having a list of celebrations, things that we're celebrating that have happened in that year since Cleveland, and we ran out of space on the paper. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, uh, next up is Latinx Affinity Group Session Deepening Community Leveraging Our Collective Power.
And the last thing I'll say is we talked a lot about action because we believe in action as TCG models action every day in these conversations. So we talked about the shame that sometimes comes when you are chosen for something that represents part of your culture and you wonder if that's okay. And along with that, we talked about what can you do in those moments? How do you name something that does belong to you, but also bring people up who maybe are not being seen because you are holding the privilege? Um, someone I love here in the room and other people said, name three people every time you go up. Every time you're the person who's chosen because of both your talent and your privilege, you name, you thank them and take that thing that you deserve, but you also bring other people with you. So that's the work that we're trying to do. Thank you. Next up is Multiple Entry Points, a space for white folks working toward racial justice. So first we just want to take a moment, if you're able, to just raise your hand if you're in space. Just for a moment. Hold on. Keep them up. Thank you. So on Thursday, um, Carmen just laid out the strategy behind all of these at the intersections sessions, and it's really about making that intentional space for voices that have traditionally been marginalized, and what, these spaces that have been happening for years that we wanted to legitimize and, and add voice to. <clears throat> Our space was different. The four of us hosted a space for white people working towards racial justice. White caucuses are also rooted in the, in the civil rights movement, when people of color called on white people to go to work with other white people to dismantle white supremacy. We have not done that. <laughs> to take responsibility for growing our own analysis and pushing other white folks to do the same. So that's what we did. <laughs> we used a learning tool by Tima Okun called From White Racist to White Anti-Racist, which lays out a ladder of empowerment with stages that white people go through as they are coming into racial awareness and unlearning racism. It's up on Conference 2.0, and we encourage you, if you identify as white, to go and find it and read it and reread it and reread it and reread it and reread it. And reread it. Um, it's also up there, so if there are folks of color who want to share it with white friends and allies, please do that, and please know that we would be happy to back you up in those conversations. Uh, white I, have one more, I have one more sentence, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was um, we also put together a list of other resources that we will be adding to. Year and we're asking again, get on board, please. Um, you know, take a risk. We can no, you can no longer be in this field, be leaders, without building your anti-racist, anti-aggressive understanding. If you do not agree with that, that is all the more reason to engage. Nothing more important, people are dying. <laughs> True. Okay, thank you. Um, Intergenerational Leaders of Color meeting is up next. revolution in 19, whatever that was, and, uh, and now we're in 1996 or so, uh, and now uh, we were in a room where we kept having to add chairs and tables. Uh, and uh, I've been doing this work a long, long time, and uh, I have to say just a personal thing, that I feel that uh, I don't need to shoulder it by myself anymore. <laughs> Um, I don't... I don't know that our folks with Jubilee were reached out 
about two to speak now, but this work that you're doing is a part of the work that we're talking about now. So if anyone from Jubilee, the breakfast, or the dine around wants to speak to this, Hi, we're from the Jubilee uh, Committee, the Jubilee Movement. This is Kirk Lynn, I'm Aditi Kapil. And we're actually kind of hoping to throw a party in 2020 of a very particular kind that supports all the work that everyone's been talking about, which we find so moving. Um, Kirk's gonna tell you what kind of party, though. Uh, the premise is pretty simple. Just a, a few ragtag people got together and thought it would be fun if in the year 2020, 2021, there was a nationwide theater festival that presented uh, work of people of color, women, LBGTQ, trans, indigenous people, uh, and artists with disabilities, and that that was all the theater that you could see in the U.S. for one year. Um, <laughs> All you, you can reach out to me, I'm Kirk at Rudemex, or Jamie at HowlRound, or at Dee, I don't know your email, but we email all the time. Um, uh, and it really is leaderless, so your passion, your influence, your doubts, all those things can join the committee and can help us uh, make it better. With just these sort of ragtag phone calls, we have 55 theaters already committed, uh, and I think we're pretty close, we're gonna have 100% of all theaters in America, I feel confident. <laughs> Just to get through, I also want to say all the theaters that are already doing this work, we'd love to have you signed on. We, we, we see the theaters that have already been doing this work for years now are kind of the elders of our movement, and everyone should be learning from them. So you can sign on as individuals, you can sign on as an institution committed to going for your own Jubilee year, however you define that. Um, and please do pop on. I think it's what howlrounds.com slash jubilee right now is where you can do that. And my email is at dvpapilagalpoo.com. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Next up, this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we're going to be talking about practicing art activism. Carol McCord reflects on lessons learned from the 426 NEA meeting. And we are specifically asking folks who are, who are not Carol or Carmen, anyone who wants to stand up and in less than two minutes speak to anything that landed with you. Hi, I'm Sanja Parks. Uh, the, it was really re revelatory for me and a very um, a comforting space to be in. One of the things that was discussed is the cost of silence, the cost of not speaking up, and, and uh, what it costs those who you're not speaking up for. Okay, we have a little more time if anybody else wants to speak. Right? But that, I mean, that was a lot to say. Cause like, yeah? Okay. Um, next up, we're going to honor some of our ground at 20s. First up of them is Independence and Reciprocity, the Latino Theater Company, interviewed by Chantal Rodriguez of the Latino Theater Company. <laughs> Anybody want to talk about what happened in that space? is going to be making room for deaf artists in the hearing industry.
So our issues were less global, more specifically talking about issues having to do with trying that integration between hearing and deaf artists when it comes to the theater. And we were talking about creating and designing where we bring in deaf people from the very beginning of that whole process, making those production decisions, making those artistic decisions so that the rest becomes far easier to implement those changes in that process. We were talking about a variety of accessibility possibilities. So for example, interpreters at every step training the crew, hiring deaf crew members, teaching crew members sign language, using lighting for cues, using a visual system. And the bottom line was really that we wanted to share the message, don't be afraid, we're here, we're your best resource, we're here to help out. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is Queer Movement Building. opportunity to uh, create a space where we can start thinking about some actionable items of how we as theater practitioners can uh, use our skills in order to build the movement around uh, the queer identity. We had about 70 people in the room. We made some amazing maps. We doubled the number of self-identifying lesbians from the previous year from three to six. <laughs> Provided a framework of how you can do that same kind of mapping and questioning around strategies in your own uh, home, own organizations, and own space. And I think people walked away with that. And hopefully, everyone has some great ideas to take and move forward. We, we saw some serious, serious content development in nine minute segments using a World Cafe format about how to end the patriarchal heteronormativity to which we are subjected, how to not make trans artists into mascots. Right? How to make safe spaces and hold lots of Latinx dance parties to respond to Orlando and how to celebrate all of the diversity of our voices within the queer movement. It was great! <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, next up is going to be another Ground in 20. A forward stance featuring Jorge Ortol, Mayi Theater Company, interviewed by Snehal Desai of East West Players. Snehal! Hi everyone. We, um, so we had a wonderful interview, a conversation between Jorge uh, Ortol, who is the executive director of Mayi Theater Company, uh, and myself, who is, represents East West Players, two of the Asian American theater companies. It's all teams, so you should just watch it. <laughs> too much longer. Um, but the thing, uh, three things we wanted to highlight is that we need to remember that there's a greater world out there, and we need to not hide from it, but engage and embrace it, and engage, engage and embrace those artists. Um, we talked about August Wilson's uh, groundbreaking speech and how it was both inspiring as he talked about his perspective, but how also the world is not black or white, there is a binary, um, there, no, not a binary world, but that there is um, so much in between, and we need to acknowledge that as we move from becoming a majority minority nation. Um, we really talked about how important, how our biggest gift is that we are storytellers, that we can impact change through the stories we tell how it's important for us to tell stories that tell the history of people of color, of, minor, of people of color, of, of, of other sexual orientations, of indigenous populations, because that's how we can create the new ground uh, that we stand on. Um, and the last thing we talked about is that uh, none of us sit there, well, I don't sit there and talk to one race all, any, all day, um, but that's what we see on our stages, so that rather than having plays that are just black plays, or Latino plays, or Asian American plays, how about we have plays we all are, that we all are in today. Thank you. Next up is the Theaters of Color Breakfast. Marshall or Leslie, are you here? If not, anyone else who was there want to represent? Uh, through 
staff development, through pooling resources, and through equitable partnerships. Some great ideas that came out of that was um, using senior citizens who might not be in the workforce anymore but still have a lot of knowledge to share um, and history and experience. Um, to deprioritize results and to prioritize the process so that we can um, bring people up who might be less experienced and um, uh, uh, broaden our base of experienced people that way. You um, address the non-traditional staff, a non-traditional staff structure. Um, uh, Oh, seeds for a national think tank uh, for theaters of color sustainability, and potentially a national database for theaters of color patrons and workers. Next up, calling in and calling on transgender nonconforming, non-binary, two-spirit solidarity in action. Ignore. 
um, and forgets in our own spaces. He also talked about, uh, if you see something happening, say, don't assume that someone else is going to take care of it. Make sure that you speak up for those people that you think can speak up for themselves, but maybe they can't. And just to be better allies. And also we talked about establishing codes of conduct that every institution should have. This is what abuse means to us. And this is what you should look at. And this is what every single person who steps into this institution needs to see and needs to sign. <laughs> I guess the only other thing I would add is that we talked about um, utilizing the resources that we have in our communities beyond the theaters and making sure that we're incorporating social justice organizations to do trainings for our staff, um, to do conversations around our content, um, and to, if we need mediators for specific situations, and giant, uh, whole additional topic, looking at the images of gender-based violence that we put on our stages and the images that we put on our stages. Yes. That should be a session for the next conference. Um, uh, Lean in, American Theatre Women.
We talked in our group, uh, it was a presentation of some research that's being done um, at ACT and supported by Wellesley College on um, the, the demographics and the distribution of women in leadership, executive leadership, and artistic leadership. Um, the, the information is available on ACT's um, website. Um, and in, so there was the presentation and then we had some breakout groups just to talk about or visioning different models. And some of the models that we um, visioned together um, were creating a pipeline for leadership. Right, we talked about um, the problematic structure of the pyramid and um, the movement up to leadership and how we should try to challenge that, um, that structure of uh, being willing to hire people we don't know, to put the time into getting to know those people and to, to uh, bring them up if necessary, to use interns, uh, to mentor interns and early career employees um, to uh, diversify freelancer opportunities, to get them into the leadership pipeline, um, to look into uh, non-traditional leadership models like shared leadership, um, to have 360 degree awareness, to uh, have a referral network. Uh, and then, um, because I didn't know we were doing this, um, I will encourage you uh, on August 22nd, there will be a convening that will present the full research in San Francisco at ACT, so check out their website. Um, they're doing incredible work uh, on this project. Thank you. Next up is the round at 20, a conversation with Native Voices at the Autry's Randy Reinholz, interviewed by John Bruce Scott. Gene Bruce Scott. Woo! We know we mostly celebrated the amount of work being done by Native Americans in the professional theater. We um, celebrated the professional theater for including Native people in a purposeful way. We wonder why it's not done more often. And um, really happy about the conversations that augmented this conversation about how to work with Native people and Native images on your stages in the most respectful, uh, thoughtful ways that empower and uh, start to do away with historical violence. And we all realize we stand on the shoulders of giants. That is one thing that binds us together in the theater. We celebrate great artists, been a lot of Western artists for a long time, and here we are at 20 years, and it's a new set of artists that I realize influenced me. And you know, I was a young artist aspiring to August Wilson and Lloyd Richards' style and caliber of work, and I'm thrilled to be in that American theater. Yes. is Black Lives Matter, Civil Engagement, and the Responsibility of Theater. <laughs> Claudia, Patricia, Joe, Tyrone, anyone who was there want to speak to what happened? Okay. How you guys doing? So we just talked about um, the importance of the work that we're doing right now and also the national kind of uh, convening that we're doing with every 28 hours. And this October will be our national month of um, putting it all together. And so a lot of these are involved, just talking about getting involved with your community, having a discussion around the issues and making sure that folks know about every 28 hours. Okay. Uh, next up is giving voice to the voiceless in your community. Anyone from that session want to speak? And just the essential nature of the arts in every child's life, particularly children who, these unaccompanied minors who come here and have a lot of social emotional issues and that the arts are the way that it has allowed them to heal, to grow, and to strengthen, and to ultimately lead as we saw all of our students today. Thank you. Good, so you know, you know the clock. 
uh, reframing the narrative of sovereignty. Looking for Ty, Rihanna, Betsy. Hey everyone, we talked about um, uh, tribal sovereignty, and um, I'm looking for Rihanna, who's here. So uh, we explained our stories as sovereign nations uh, through a sovereignty lens, and we sort of compared those to uh, TCG values and looked at global citizenship, and we just wanted to um, reinstate and recognize uh, Turtle Island in which we stand. Um, we took a little bit of time to not lecture, but to explain about our status not only as uh, people of color, but also as citizens of sovereign nations. Um, and a lot of people misunderstand that there is no sovereigns, uh, separate sovereigns inside the United States, and there is. Um, so we took a look at um, the value statements that TCG made as a really good jumping off place, because um, for Native people, our values are really important to us. Um, and what we wanted to do was remap our sovereignty our, and from our values onto um, TCG. Um, and I'll let you come talk about some of our suggestions. So some of our suggestions that the group came up with was with artistry, inclusion, and activism that to be recognized with us US citizens to add citizenship in maybe some of the global dialogues to set up consent and guidelines for our intellectual property rights to include us in the work across borders and boundaries for peace and understanding and to really implement renewal and call to action for all people to have protocols when they're making theater with uh, indigenous nations in our countries. Next up will be Refugee Nation, activating art from a borderless perspective. Oh yeah! <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a refugee. Okay, think about that. Raise your hand if you're an immigrant. Raise your hand. Okay, guess what? We're dealing with refugees and immigrants in this country. I'm a refugee, and I have been empowered through theater to have my voice. So that's what Refugee Nation was all about. Go ahead, Leymar, and tell us how you just said it. Um, we, uh, we had talked about the work we've been doing over the last decade of uh, working with Laotian refugees in the US, and how that naturally has progressed to working with the current refugee crisis, and how there's so much in common with other refugees arriving now that can be learned after 40 years since the Vietnam War. Um, we have seen people in leading roles with refugee resettlement, um, immigration lawyers, uh, citizenship uh, agents who are now in those positions of power who are now helping the recent refugees. And theater can help tell those stories and empower refugees to tell those stories. And um, yeah. anything else, someone who was in my session, want to throw out there, they love me. <laughs> Good. Sorry, we weren't prepared either. <laughs> We offer this prompt, uh, this is how we'll, we'll offer this prompt. Uh, in your vodka, vodka is a word, a Hawaiian word for canoe. In your vodka, what do you carry with you if you were forced, if you were forced to leave? So think about that. And I also want to leave with one thing. Imua. Imua is a Hawaiian word that means forward, to progress. Every time we worked uh, with our communities at the end of it, we close out with imua. Imua means to go forward, to progress. We say it three times. The first time for yourself, imua, forward, progress. The second time for the circle of people that you work with, that you speak with, that you work with on that day, imua. And the third time for the rest of the world. So I offer you that, I ask you to do that with me. So three times, imua, imua, imua. One, two, three. Imua, imua, imua. Staging the anti-immigrant hysteria, documenting the stories of undocumented people. Is Jose Torres Tana in the house? Jose! <laughs> All right. Does anyone want to speak to what they saw and heard and witnessed in Jose's session? 
We have the privilege of hosting him about uh, two or three years ago at LATC. He's a wonderful, wonderful artist, and he's so smart. He is a scholar. He does so much research. So sometimes he'll make outlandish statements, and damn it, he can back it up. He can back it up. <laughs> and um, we asked him, well, you know, you're kind of preaching to the choir here with everything you're saying. How is it going to spaces where uh, you're, it's a little confrontational for people? And he said, humor. Humor and the, big, the biggest compliment to him was when someone would come up and tell him, you know, well, I have my impression or uh, idea or opinion about immigration, but uh, you made me laugh. <laughs> and you know, that's and he, he feels very strongly that if he can create a space where he has made an awareness, made a step forward in someone's mind, if he has moved someone's heart. That that it, you know he has fulfilled his responsibility as an artist and oh man I hope we get him back at LITC soon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next up is the Ground in Twenty, uh, Middle East Center Stage, featuring Tarajik Hazarian, Golden Thread Productions, interviewed by Jamil Corey of Silk Road Rising. The good thing is this has been recorded, so if you will hear <laughs> these voices, they are not lost from this four square circle. Uh, last up, what do we do about Trump? Question mark. <laughs> Was, uh, were any of our speakers, I'm looking at Francine, Mike, Maurice, Nelson, Anyone here want to speak to what happened, or anyone who was in the session want to speak to what was said? I guess we'll never know what to do about Trump. <laughs> uh, the conversation started highlighting some of the disparity between mainstream American theater and politically active American theater, and which is a larger issue that should be resolved. Uh, was the general consensus of the room. Um, and then moving into specific action points that we can enable before November. Uh, one of the people in the room was a deputized voter registrant. You can go onto your Secretary of State's state website and find out how to become someone who can register voters, and you can do that in your theater's lobby. We also talked about how the outcome of Brexit and the sort of voters' remorse that received that received in the UK can be used to leverage complacent voters who might not be registered or might not think that Trump is an actual problem that we need to deal with to sort of inspire them to actually show up and vote. bigger and bigger and bigger, and it just feels like it's feeding something. Doesn't it feel good? So stand if you're able, we're going to close out. Uh, the Latina folks. Um, there is a vision of the beloved community. This is it. This is it, folks. And Ty, you brought us into the space. Ty, can you just come and close us out? Uh, regrets, Carmen. Uh, if, yeah, if you could, um, not to get all kumbaya on you, if you could hold the person's hand on your right and on your left side, um, I'd like to do that so we're one continuous chain Consent, please. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Hey, honey, day, 